Fantastic. Uh, welcome, everyone, to your first uh, Boeing Global Markets Pandemic Year. So it's my great pleasure uh, to, uh, to introduce Professor Lucy Ming from Stanford University. So uh, I'll do a brief introduction. Okay. So Lucy obtained his PhD from France in 2004. Uh, and after that, he spent two years as a postdoc at Caltech. And then uh, he spent six years as a professor at the University of Texas at Austin, that's where we met. Uh, and then since 2005, he has been a professor at Stanford University. So Lucy has obtained many honors and awards, so I have just a bunch of few of them. So he won the Slow Fellowship, the Life Science Career Award. And then the from the Academy of Science, and also uh, James Richardson Prize from SAM uh, in Germany. Uh, and this year, I think he also he was invited to give uh, a lecture at the International Congress of Mathematics. So I guess, uh, please. Okay. Yeah. All right. Oh, can, can everyone hear me? Okay. Uh, first, uh, thank, thank you very much for the. I think it is on. Okay. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, first to the department for inviting me for this Boeing colloquium. And uh, it's, uh, I was here more than 20 years ago. Uh, I don't know. Back then, I was still a graduate student. Uh, um, it's nice to be back. And uh, thank you, Jingwei, for the nice introduction. And. Uh, I met a lot of colleagues uh, this morning and this afternoon and enjoyed the discussion and looking forward to more uh, discussions. So uh, today I'm going to give a talk, which, which is the first time I'm giving, uh, giving, uh, I'm giving this talk. The title is called uh, Correcting Convexity Biases. So um, since I'm the first time I'm, I'm going to give it, so maybe I'm a little bit rusty. So uh, if anything's not clear or if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt me in the middle and I'll be happy to answer the questions. Okay. So uh, this is joint work with a bunch of people. Uh, so Philip Etter uh, was my PhD student who graduated last year. And now he moved on to industry. He's uh, currently working in Seattle at the uh, Meta Reality Lab. And the second person is Chao Ma, who is uh, uh, right now a uh, Zico assistant professor at the Stanford University. So he he's, has done a lot of amazing work, including this one. And, uh, and, uh, um, and, and he's going to be on job market this year. So mm, if you like the work, maybe you can take a look at his profile. And the third one is Sean Tao, as, as my PhD student at Stanford University. And finally is Yu Hua Zhu, uh, who recently uh, finished the postdoc at Stanford University and moved on to UC San Diego as assistant professor. Okay. All the work I've done here is supported by National Science Foundation, the computational math program. Okay. So I think the first question I need to answer is, is what do I mean by convexity bias? Okay. So this talk is a little bit different from the usual stuff I do. It's, it has a little bit statistics flavor. So uh, hopefully, I, I mean, I, I think the first two slides are the most important thing. So if, if, if you are tired by now, just bear with me for five minutes, and then you can do whatever you want. Okay. So what do I mean by convexity bias? So let's just take a look at two simple examples. So the first examples I have here is that is, is, is that, uh, it's the following. So I have x star, which is an unknown quantity, which on the real line. And the z is a Gaussian random variable. Okay. But I don't know what x star is. I only get to observe x, which is defined to be x star plus z. So I, I observe a noisy version of that. Okay? The goal of this problem is trying to estimate not x star, but x star square. Okay? I want to study the square of the underlying truth. Okay? x star square. Now, um, so if you take a look at the problem, that the naive estimator will, will say that, okay, I'm just going to take my x and plug it into this function. I get fx is equal to x star. Now I report to you that this is my best guess. Okay, so this will be the first naive guess because I only have one single sample. What do I do? I just take the sample, plug it into my function f, and try to report to you. This is my answer. But but unfortunately, that's the not best thing you can do. Is that uh, it's very easy to see that is that all you have to do is just try to estimate what is the expectation of the quantity that I return x star, right? Because x star x is equal to sorry x is equal to x star plus z, so therefore I can expand this quadratic. And this is equal to the expectation of x star square plus 2 times the expectation of 2x star times z plus expectation of z square. Now, the first term does not depend on noise anymore. So it's just x star square, which I write down here. The second term involves the product. 
but z itself is in x, this is a constant. So essentially, this is the, just a constant times expect, ex, expectation of z. But z is a Gaussian random noise, mean zero, so therefore the expectation will be equal to zero. So this term dropout is zero. And finally, the last term will be expectation of z squared. But for a Gaussian random variable, what is expectation of z squared? It's going to be equal to one, right? Normal, a standard normal Gaussian. So therefore, the expectation of the quantity that you report to me, which x squared, is in fact is equal to x squared star plus one. So what it says to you is that, in fact, on average, you will overestimate a little bit. You will report a quantity which, on average, is a little bit larger. So how do you get a better estimator? Well, you just subtract this quantity 1 here, right? If you subtract this quantity 1, you report x squared plus minus 1. And the expectation of x squared minus 1 will be equal to x star squared. So that will be a better estimator, OK? So there's quite a little bit of algebra here. If you don't like algebra, let's just take a look at the figures. This is what it says. This curve itself is a quadratic function, x squared. My ground truth is this red point. But I don't know where the red point is, right? I, I want to approximate what? Approximate its square value. So this corresponding to the red point right above it. Now, because I polluted it with a Gaussian random noise, so the quantity that I actually observe is what? It's not this red point, but some like a blue points which stay around it. OK, it's a Gaussian distribution of the blue points centered at the red point. So I'm drawing only these two blue points. Now, what this fx equal to x squared does is evaluating the value, the function value, at these blue points, which give you these blue points on these two curves, on this curve, on this x squared curve. Now, if you take the expectation, what do you see? The expectation of these two blue curves will give you the blue dot in the middle, which have an overestimate over the true red point that you want to estimate. So this overestimate is actually corresponding to the one here. Now, what should we do? Well, what we do is actually just subtract these blue points by one to bring down into these green points. And if I now take the average of the green points, it's actually going to be closer. In fact, in this case, it's exactly equal to the, on average, equal to the red point that I want to evaluate. OK? So this is the picture illustrate the idea of, of what happened here. Second example. In the second example, we have a very similar scenario. We have x star, which is unknown, and z is, again, the Gaussian random noise. So what I want to do is that I want to, I, I, what I observe is x equal to x star plus z, and now I want to exp ex estimate the exponential of the ground truth, which is unknown. Okay. Now the naive estimator would be fx is equal to exponential of x, because if I only have one single variable, a single observation x, what do I do? I plug it into my exponential function and report it to you. But however, I claim that this is also not the best, because if you take a look at the exponential of e to the power x, this is equal to exponential of e to the x star, which is the unknown, but I can nevertheless, I still argue with it, plus my noise. Because this and this are independent, so therefore I can take the e to the x star out, and then all I have to do is estimate the exponential of ez. And now what is exponential of ez? This is a very simple calculation in probability. The exponential of the ez Gaussian random variable is equals to 1 over 2 pi integral of e to the z times the Gaussian kernel, which is e to the minus z squared over 2 and dz, right? Then what you do by complete square, if you do by complete square, this is equal to 1 over 2 pi e to the z, e to the minus z squared over 2, times e to the half minus, times e to the half, and I put a dz here. But you see that by complete the square, this is nothing but e to the minus z minus 1 squared, or rather minus a half, did I screw up? Oh, hopefully not. Okay, let me see. Did I screw up? Uh, no. Yes, one half in the front. Thank you. Square dz integral, one over two pi, and with this extra e to the half factor. But this is just a shift of Gaussian, so it's equal to one. So you totally drop out. So the answer is e to the power half. Just pop out. So therefore, what you actually get is not you. What you have is e to the power half times e to the power x star. So therefore, in order to get e to the power x star, what should I do? I should just divide this factor. So instead of using the naive estimator e to the power x, I use e to the power x times this inverse of this factor, which is e to the minus a half here, I'll get a better one. Okay. Again, let me just draw this, show you this picture here. I draw this last night, so uh, it's, it's a little bit, it's not so pretty, but hopefully it's going to illustrate the idea. So this is the exponential function. Again, I have the red point, which is my ground truth. I don't know what that is. Put in Gaussian, you pollute it, it becomes one of these blue points with equal probability. And if you evaluate the exponential, you get these two blue points. This is my EZ here. 
sorry, EX here. If you take the average, you will get this middle point. It's going to overestimate over my ground truth, the red point. So what, you do, what, what did you do here by using this better estimator? What you do is that you're going to shrink these blue points by a factor e to the power minus a half, and you bring them down. Once you bring them down, you take a look at the average. It's going to exactly pass through this red point. Okay? Is that clear, everyone? So this is the most important picture um, of, of the whole talk. Okay. Now, what do these two examples in common? Well, the first example is a square function. The second example is exponential function. Or you might say that, hey, these two functions are both convex. Because these functions are both bent this way. So therefore, that's why by the Johnson's inequality, the exponential, sorry, the expectation of my function f evaluated to x is going to be strictly greater because I have noise to the f evaluated at exponential of x. So exponential, of, uh, so, so, so this is equal to f x star. And since this is f, the quantity that I want to estimate, if you just do the naive plug-in estimator, that will overestimate a little bit. But if you think about for a second, well, convex is not the only case that make it work. If I have a concave function, that will also have a similar phenomenon, except that Instead of a shrink down, I need to shrink up a little bit. Okay? So here I'm just taking the previous picture and flip it. You see that this is what happens when I have minus of e to the x, and this is the function what I will have is minus x squared. Okay? So therefore, it's not just about the convex function. It also works for concave function. Okay? So in fact, this, what, this phenomenon happens quite obviously when this function fx try, I'm trying to, to, to estimate is actually strongly bent near my ground truth. Okay? Either upward or downward, either concave, concave, convex or concave. And also, this is also quite significant when the noise is large. Because if the noise is small, these two blue points will not deviate too much from the red points. So therefore, linear approximation will be quite well. You will get a very good estimator. This only happens when these blue points move far away so that you feel the curvature of the function. Okay. So this phenomenon is what I call the convexity bias. Okay? And... Uh, I mean, why do I call it a convexity bias, not a concavity bias? The reason is because if you open all the literature, the textbook, we always talk about convex analysis, convex functions, right? We never say about a concave analysis, right? So, you know, just in the spirit of this, we just have to pick one word, and I call it a convexity analysis. And in fact, this is not just about a convex function, it's about all the functions which is quite bendy, okay? What is this talk about? This talk is about trying to correct this called convexity bias, for a family of general, fairly general family of functions fx. Okay, so the general setup is that I'm going to given single single sample x or maybe a bunch of sample of this ground truth, and these are all mean zero copy of this ground truth, and I'm trying to estimate this function which f evaluated x star. Okay, now from the previous two slides, we know that naive estimator fx just by take this random variable and plug in here is not always the best solution we have. And we can, in fact, exploit the convexity or concavity a little bit and try to do something slightly better. And this is what we are going to do. Now, in this talk, I'm going to specifically consider two kinds of estimators, two kinds of corrections. One is called additive correction, which is take my fx and plus a constant, minus a constant, like what we did for the quadratic function, x squared. Or we're going to do this so-called multiplicative correction, just multiply the whole thing by a scalar s, like what we did in the exponential function. Now, um, in fact, the, 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 because, because we're trying to consider general problem, I mean, the, the, it's, it's going to be more difficult than the, the, the two examples we have seen already. So the difficulty really comes from two uh, sources. The one is that uh, for a general problem, the x, my observation itself, could be high dimensional. Okay? It could be a long vector, it could be a matrix, it could be a tensor. And also, the output of my function f is not necessarily always a scalar. It could also be a matrix, could also be a tensor, right? So when you get a high dimensional problem, naturally things become more complicated. The second complication comes from the fact that in many cases, the noise model is not necessarily known. In the two examples I give you, I know that the noise I plug in is always Gaussian. So therefore, I can do analytic, sorry, analytic calculation to, to, to tell you that this is the right factor so you can remove from my, 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 my plug-in estimator to get a better estimator. But if the noise model is not known, then I have to do something uh, more complicated. So more specifically, I'm going to consider two cases. One case is I call the scalar function f. This function, in this case, the function f is going to actually take a high dimensional input and out high dimensional, meaning that is something greater than 10, okay? And it could be 100, it could be 1,000, but typically it's not two or three dimensional. 
It takes a high dimensional input and it spit out a value. So this is the case called, I call the scalar case. And in this case, I will consider the specific scenario that instead of having only one single sample x, I assume that I have a small number of samples. You see, because I don't want to assume anything on my probability, the probability distribution of my noise, so I have to get some information about my noise somewhere, right? If I only have one single sample, and you don't even tell me what noise is, I could even assume noise equal to zero. And then in this case, the plug-in estimate is actually the best. So therefore, I have to get some information about noise. In order to get some information about the noise, here I assume that I have a small number of IID samples of my ground truth, okay? In the second case is the matrix case. And here the function f, sorry. So here the function f is actually gonna take a matrix and output another matrix. More specifically, I'm gonna consider this example. F A is equal to the inverse of a matrix, okay? Now here, um, I consider a slightly different scenario. So I will assume that I only have one simple X, sing, is, is one single sample X, but I will assume that I know a little bit about the noise model, i.e. that I will have a black box machinery which allow me to add a noise on my sample. So let's not worry too much about these details, let's take a look at the scalar case first. So the rest of the talk is gonna be two parts. The first is a scalar case, and the second is a matrix case, okay? Very simple. Now, for the scalar case, let's, let, let's first consider the additive scenario, okay? As I said, instead of assuming just one single uh, sample, assume that I have n samples, where n is not a huge number. So we're not in the large uh, asymptotic limit of the statistics. We only care about a small number of samples. So let's know them by x1, x2, all the way to xn. These are id noisy samples, mean zero noisy samples of my ground truth x star. And what I want to estimate is fx star, okay? So the naive estimator is what? The naive estimator is, uh, naive estimator is this f, maybe I should stand here and I'm getting a little bit tired looking this, this way. The naive estimator will just, because I have a bunch of samples now, so the best thing is to take my x1 to xn and then average it, right? Because by averaging, I get closer to my ground truth, right? Think about I have five samples now. I average these five samples. This is my notation for average. I take the sum and divide it by the total number. If I average this, this quantity will be much closer to x star compared to the original samples. And if I use this average copy and plug it into my function f, that should give me a better one, okay? But I claim that this is not the best we can do as we have seen in the previous examples. What we're gonna do is that we're gonna consider an additive correction which is on top of this function f applied to my average, I will add a constant correction. Okay. Now what would be the best constant correction? Well in fact, analytically you can do that easily, assuming that you know the distribution. So one thing that in statistics people typically do is you want to minimize the so-called mean square error. So you take your estimator, which is f applied to the average, plus this constant c, I'm trying to decide the c here, and minus f x star, this is the target that I want to approximate, and then I take the square and take the expectation. Okay. Now, assuming that everything is, is uh, all the, you can carry out these expectations, you can just take the derivative with respect to C of this quantity, and this is the first year calculus, right? You solve a quadratic problem, and you, it's a, the solution pops out that C has to be equal to fx star minus expectation of f applied to the average. Now, this is an estimator which uh, typically in statistic community called a Oracle quantity, it's an Oracle estimator. Why would we call it Oracle? Because we cannot estimate this, we cannot evaluate this quantity just based on the data given to us. Only God can do that. Only someone know the probability distribution of the ground truth can do that. Why? Because first, in the definition of these, the first term actually depend on x star. So if I know x star, I don't, I don't even need to do c, right? I mean, I just can plug in x star. So I don't know x star. So the first term I cannot evaluate. And the second term I cannot evaluate either, why? Because this is taking the expectation respect to the noise. But if I don't know the noise model, I cannot evaluate that either, okay? So therefore, this quantity is, is, is kind of helpful, but nevertheless, from a computational point of view, it's not very useful because we cannot implement it. So how we, what are we gonna do? Well, we're gonna approximate it by a technique called bootstrapping. So for those of you who have worked a bit in statistics, you know bootstrapping is an extremely powerful technique, and here we're gonna use it and try to prove some theorems about this, okay? Now, Again, here I'm reproducing what we want to approximate. We want to approximate the C, which is given by fx star minus the expectation of f applied to average. 
Now, in order to introduce Bootstrap, uh, it's, it's a big field, and I can spend a whole lecture and maybe, I mean, several lectures talk about it. But the idea is actually very simple, is that we want to look at this quantity, this problem in a slightly different angle. Now, let's use mu to, dis, to, to denote the, uh, the unknown distribution of this quantity, x star plus z. Okay? x star is known, the noise model z is known, but nevertheless, we know that such mu exists. Okay. What is the task of evaluating c? It's a map such that it's going to take the mu, which is unknown mu, and try to evaluate this f of x star. But if, in terms of the mu, x star itself is just equals to the first moment of mu, the mean, the mean one. So my notation here is that mu one is equal to the integral of the x d mu x, right? But, but this is just x plus expectation of x plus z, x star plus z. Because this is noise is mean zero, so therefore this is actually equal to x star. So I jumped a few steps, but this mu one here, the first moment of my mu distribution, is in fact is equal to this x star here. So these two, this quantity and this quantity are exactly the same. I'm just rewriting it. Is that clear, everyone? Okay. Now the second quantity, I, I'm highlighting that this expectation in fact is taking respect to mu, because all these samples xi's are generated from this mu distribution. So therefore, the quantity c that you want to compute is, in fact, is a function no depend on this mu probability distribution. Now, what is the idea of the bootstrap? Bootstrap said that I don't know mu, but I know something which is close to mu, which is the empirical distribution of the samples that you give me at the beginning. So you, at the beginning, you give me five samples. These five samples are not exactly reproduce mu, but if you take a look at the empirical distribution by putting a delta mass at each of the samples and then take the average over five, and this mu tilde, the empirical distribution, actually is fairly close to mu, if n is not too small. So therefore, instead of evaluating c based on mu, I can reproduce this procedure, hopefully, applying to mu tilde. This is the bootstrap idea. And now, so in terms of the formula, it essentially says that instead of here, everything, instead of just use mu, I will reproduce with mu tilde. So the first term, instead of f mu 1, it becomes f 1 mu tilde, which is the mean of my empirical distribution. And here, instead of taking the expectation respect to mu, I take the expectation respect to mu tilde, which means that these new samples xi are not generated from mu anymore, but generated from mu tilde. Now, all this can be done. Why? Because what is the, what is the mu 1 tilde 1? What is the first moment, the mean of mu tilde? Mu tilde is my empirical distribution. So therefore, the moment is essentially the average of my data that you give to me. Is that clear, everyone? So you have the empirical distribution. Yes. Error means that it's a map. From the mu tilde, I'm trying to infer this quantity here. OK. Thank you. Here, the second quantity is that this xi tilde is now actually going to sample it from this mu tilde distribution. But I do have access to mu tilde. This is the data that you give to me, right? So all I need to do is just resample this mu tilde many, many times to estimate this expectation of mu tilde. Now, if you're willing to, to spend a lot amount of work, you can, in fact, estimate this whole quantity exactly. Okay? But in practice, what you do is that you just resample a capital K times. And in each group of sample I get, I'm going to put a dec de decorated with a superscript K. And this will be a very good approximation to this quantity. So therefore, the correction I'm going to use, introduce, is that this I denoted by C tilde. I'm going to use C tilde instead of C. C, I don't know. It's an oracle quantity. I cannot estimate. But C tilde, I do have access to it. And the C tilde is just simply defined to be apply f to my mean of my samples that you give to me minus this bootstrap copies. OK? So this is my bootstrap estimator. What can we say about this accuracy? Well, we can prove the following theorem. This is appeared in a paper by mine and myself earlier this year. So we have to assume that the noise is mean 0 and the noise is symmetric. Okay, we have to also assume a few moments, conditions. It's all laid out in the paper, but I don't have, it's, it was just cluttered here, so I, I leave them out. The important quantity is the following four quantities. It's M2, M4. M2 is just the second moment tensor of my random variable. M4 is the fourth order moment of my random variable. And also I have this important sigma 2, sigma 3. So what is the sigma 2? Sigma 2 is the trace of M2 of the Hessian of my objective function x star. So sigma 2 is a trace of the m2 applied to the Hessian of fx star. Now, let's just simplify the discussion a little bit. Let's assume my noise 
this is my m2 is what? Is my second, is a covariance of my random variable, right? Assuming this is just identity. Assume that noise is just ID to simplify. And this is just the trace of the square of x star. Now, what is the trace of this hash matrix? The trace of the hash matrix is corresponding to the eigenvalue, this principal directions of my Hessian, and then I add them together, right? It's equal to the summation of i from 1 to d of the lambda i's eigenvalues of the Hessian of fx star. So therefore, in some sense, this is really averaging over all the curvatures in all the principal directions. So this is sigma 2. And sigma 3 is a quantity which depends on the third order derivative of my function f. So you can think about this is the derivative of the Hessian. It tells you how fast the Hessian change. Now, so if we have the following condition, if sigma 2 squared over 4 plus sigma 3 is greater than 0, then there exists an n0. There's a lower bound of how many samples I need. So we can make this quantitative, and typically this is not so large. But, I mean, I, 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 I just I didn't write it down here such that for any sample n which is greater than this n0, and for sufficient large resampling of my bootstrap process, the new estimator I get, so here you notice that I have the c tilde here, so this is the bootstrap estimator which I can really compute. So what this says is the mean square error of the bootstrap estimator will guarantee an expectation to be bounded by the mean square error of the original naive estimate. So this is the theorem we can prove. Okay, so this shows you that if you use a bootstrap process, on average, you will get a mean square error smaller. Okay? Now, a few comments are in order here. So first, the sigma 2 and sigma 3, this is a kind of like a strange quantity. You have some quadratic quantity plus a linear quantity. You have to make it greater than 0. So the first I've commented that sigma 2 and sigma 3 are all dimensionless. Why? So if you use a put on the head of the physicist, and you take a look at what is m2 here. m2 has a dimension of length square, right? And what is the Hessian here? Hessian is taking two derivatives. So therefore, the dimension analysis tells you this is length square, 1 over length square. So these are all canceled out. So therefore, this is the geometric quantity. This is all the one geometric quantity. It has no dimensions. It's a dimensionless quantity. And similarly, you can do the same analysis for sigma 3. It's also a dimensionless quantity. So therefore, it makes sense to talk about equation, algebraic equation, inequalities like that. Okay, it does not violate the dimension analysis. Secondly, you see that I have this square here. What well, square essentially says that this condition only depends on absolute value of sigma 2. So therefore, it does not really care about how positive the curvature is and how negative the curvature is. As long as this average curvature, which I write down here, the average of the eigenvalues, has a clear sign, it's deviated clearly from 0, then this method will give you an advantage. Okay? So in fact, you can consider a saddle point. If you have a saddle point, as long as you have one direction, which is very bendy, the other direction is actually kind of flat, you can also use this method, even though this is not convex, not concave. Okay? So what really this convexity bias happens is that not, you don't really need the function to be strictly convex or concave. What you, all you need is that on average over the direction, it exhibits a strong bendy uh, trend. Okay? That's all you need. All right. So this is about the uh, additive case. We can also do the same thing for the multiplicative case, and I will go through this quickly. So here we have to make an extra assumption that the function f is greater than a constant. It's bounded from below. It's always a positive function. This is the, the condition that comes into the proof. And in this case, we consider this naive estimator multiplied by scalar s. We can also do the same thing. We can try to minimize this mean square error by write down this mean square error and try to optimize this s. Again, this is the quadratic uh, optimization problem. You can take the derivative and write down what s is. The true s is this. Now again, this is as I said, this is also an oracle estimator because you don't know what x star is. And, and also you need to take the expectation with respect to this mu, which is the unknown distribution of my, uh, my, my samples. So therefore, I cannot estimate this. So what do you do? You do bootstrap. So again, by now, I think we are all experts. In the bootstrap, all you need to do is just replace the mu with mu tilde and replace the ground truth with the sample average. And this really is a formula that you need to follow. And now here you have two expectations with mu tilde. If you don't want to evaluate them exactly, what you can do is just use resampling to ask to get a, 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 a very accurate copy of this. Again, we can prove a similar theorem, but it looks a little bit more ugly because, uh, as I said, you need the function to be positive, and in fact it appears here. 
you need to do, at the ground choose the function to be bounded away from zero. But nevertheless, you see that these two terms still survive. And the conclusion is also the same. There exists an n0, which is not too large, such that when n is greater than n0, and for sufficient large of resample of the bootstrap process, and the mean square error you get for this bootstrap estimator is better than the mean square error you get for the naive estimator. Okay. Now, how useful are these techniques? I give you two very simple examples, x squared and exponential of x. But hopefully you see that all we need is the function to be sufficiently convex or concave near the ground truth. And in fact, I will argue that this is actually a quite general phenomenon because many of the functions that we work with in life is actually convex or concave functions, as I will show you. So I will show you a few examples. Quadratic function, rational functions, constraint, unconstrained optimization, and finally some estimation problem related to probability distributions. Okay, I want to make a claim that this method itself, you see, is only using some convexity information. Uh, so therefore, it's not really the best, the far away from the best estimator for any of those problems. So for example, if you want to estimate entropy or estimate Wachenstein distance, there are methods which tailor designed for these problems will work much better than this method. But, 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 but hopefully, but our hope is that our method itself is actually quite general. It can be applied to a fairly general class of problems. So if you don't really want to dig it too deep into the specific problem, maybe you can fall back and use our estimator. It will actually give you some improvement. Okay. So the improvements are not spectacular uh, because the method is so general. But, but the, here, I really want to emphasize that the generality of the, our approach. Okay. So for the first example is this quadratic function. It's fx is equal to x transpose ax, where x is a, a real uh, a high dimensional RD function. And you see that this function is convex, obviously. But this function is not actually bounded away from zero, because when x is equal to zero, it's equal to zero. So therefore, it actually violates the second theorem. It's only consistent with the first theorem. So here in these figures, I'm reporting the mean square errors and also the bias uh, for different scenarios. So in each of the cases, the n, where n is the number of samples that you give me is 10. As I said, it's not too large. I only have 10 samples, not a million. I only have 10 samples. And I want to improve the estimator based on these 10 samples. And the k is the number of resample in my bootstrap. It's also not large. I set it to be 10. That actually works quite well. And the ground truth x is the un random vector on the unit sphere, which is the radius, which is equal to 2. So I have this blue curve here, which is another method which, I, which we reported in the paper. But for the time being, just forget about the blue curve. I apologize. I didn't have time to redo the figure. But ignore the blue one. So the red one is actually corresponding to the shift, which is the additive one. And the, sorry, the, sorry, the orange one is the shift, and also the red one is actually the scaled version. So first you see that, uh, first we vary the dimension. You see that when dimension is low, the improvement is not so significant. That's easy to understand, because the dimension is low, the problem is low dimensional, 10 sample will actually be quite good. It's enough to estimate your objective function, okay? Which is this function here. But as the dimension goes higher, you see that it improves, okay? Especially, for example, the shift version in this case worked quite well. And the, uh, the, 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 the scaled version is actually stagnant. And the second figure that actually tells you how this depends on the condition number of A. Right? This A itself is certain positive definite matrix. And the condition number initially was chosen to be 2. But the middle one, I choose the condition number going from 2 all the way to 1,000. And you see that it does not affect the performance too much. It improves about 40% to 70% depends on the different estimate you use. And finally, we consider this sigma. Sigma is actually the, the, the noise level. You see that we go from small noise to large noise. In fact, you see that with small noise, it actually doesn't give too much improvement. It's actually stay around one. Initial, and in fact, the red one, the, sorry, sorry, the one of them is actually go above one. So therefore, this is the one that actually violated the theorem. And, 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 and the, but as noise gets larger and larger, and because the, you feel more about the curvature, this, this is like your overshoot is getting larger, so therefore this method of correction actually gives you a benefit. The second is the rational function. Again, we try, uh, this is a rational function where the ground truth x is, 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 is positive, and also this 1 over x function is that uh, this is actually the positive function, this is the, sorry, convex function when x is positive, and, and uh, we, we pick the, the C, uh, this, this coefficient, to be also greater than, than 0 to make sure that it's, it's convex. And we study here, and also we study different cases. Uh, again, n is equal to 10, k is equal to 10, and this b is fixed to be equal to 1. Now, and this is again how to behave uh, with the dimension. As you see, the dimension goes up, the, the performances get better. 
And, and the second plot is I vary norm of C. For large C, actually, one of X for X large, for C large, it actually become quite flat. So therefore, the curvature is actually not, 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 not uh, is, is actually, is, is not, uh, is, is, oh, okay, so, so it's a homogeneous. So therefore, it's in fact, it's, it's, it's that, that, yeah, sorry, I take it back. In fact, it's, it, the performance is actually the same, similar, because it's, a, because it's really a self-similarity structure. So and finally, and I, I tried for different x. So for small x, you have a better improvement. For large x, the improvement is actually worse. So the reason is because when uh, uh, the reason is because when x is large, the function becomes quite flat. Yes, that that that's that, that's true. Yeah. Okay. All right. So uh, example number three. So maybe I want to. Mm, I mean, don't spend too much time on examples. But I just want to show you that this actually applies to quite general class of functions. So the example three is about unconstructed optimization. So my fx is defined to be the minimal of x multiply some function of my optimization parameter g, uh, fy plus gy. So in fact, if you look at this, this is a very general form, right? It's, there's a, some kind of linear dependence of x here, and then you minimize it. And I claim that this actually is a concave function. Why? Because for no matter what kind of y you have, if you fix a y, you have a linear function. So therefore, in the x-plane, so this is x, this is fx. If you fix any y, you have a linear function. You fix another y, you have a linear function. If another y, you have a linear function. Now what you want to do is that you take the mean of the linear functions. The mean of the linear function, obviously, is this envelope, right? And this is obviously a concave function. So therefore, we can try to apply our technique. So here I showed you a very simple example. Is this, in fact, is this is an optimization, which is a quadratic optimization, and you see that in all three cases, um, uh, sorry, uh, in uh, all, so, so the this, uh, yes. So I think I messed up the color a little bit. Maybe the shift and skills are, are different. So so in 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 this case, this 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 uh, both of them. Uh, do, so when the dimension is small and the improvement is fairly small. But when the dimension gets larger, and you get fairly large improvement. In the second figure, you see that uh, if I change the condition number of A, I can also see about 50% improvement when the condition number is small. But as the condition number gets large, it becomes about 25% improvement. And finally, you see that the wall of the estimator, I think this is the estimator that corresponds to the scaled version. And it's actually is, is not working well. It's because it violated the condition of the functions uniform greater than 0. But for the other estimator, which is a shift one, actually works quite well across different uh, sample parameters. Now, this is another problem, which is a constraint optimization problem. So you're trying to, the fx is defined to be the minimum over y of the function fy, which is the conv lowercase f is a convex function, subtract to the, subject to the constraint of ay is e equal to x. Now, this, I mean, if you look at this way, it's not clear to you why this is a convex function. But what you can do is that you can you write it in terms of minimax formulation. So the solution of this minimization problem can be also written as this minimax, which minimizes over y, max over mu of fy, and this is a Lagrange multiplier. Now, because this function is a convex, and this also is convex in y, and also it's linear in mu, then you can use a uh, you can you can use the minimax von Neumann minimax theorem to exchange the order. So this becomes the max of the mu and the mean of y here. Now, here now you see that this is, no matter what kind of y you have, this is some quantity depend on y. And here is the linear function in x. So therefore, if you minimize over mu, sorry, you maximize over mu, you're actually taking the upper envelope of these linear functions, so what you end up with is a convex function. So once you have the convex function, you can also use the machinery that I talk about and try to uh, bootstrap our estimator. And in, in all three cases, is that here we try the different uh, dimensions, here we try the different size of the middle matrix, this matrix A here. So P is corresponding to dimension Y. So we try the different uh, D over P ratios. I make the P larger and larger by fixing D. And also I try the different noise levels. So in all three cases, you see that we have about, well, we have different kind of improvements. Sometimes we have about 50% improvement. Sometimes we have about 25% improvement. improvement. Okay. So the improvement is not huge. It's sometimes we have 50%, sometimes we have 25%. But the point I want to emphasize is that this is a quite a general framework. Okay. Now the next example I want to show you is, yes? Uh, the improvement you're talking about, does it uh, depend on something in the 
of the baseline, the, the naive estimator. So naive estimator is one. If naive estimated error is one, I get 0 0.5. So the next example is something called entropy uh, estimation. So uh, suppose you give me a probability distribution, which is uh, supported on a finite alphabet. And uh, you can think about randomly sample from this distribution. That will give you an empirical distribution about this ground truth probability distribution. And in fact, the, so you can think about it. I have a probability distribution P defined on, our, P defined on our alphabet from S to R plus, and by through some kind of like a random sampling, I will get an empirical distribution p hat, which defines the same alphabet, also on r, right? Defines on s. Now, because my sample is id and unbiased, expectation of a p hat will be sorry. This I would rather call it p star. This is called p. So therefore, the expectation of p is in fact is equal to p star. Okay. So this that's why this this problem actually fit into our scenario. And the quantity that I want to estimate is the entropy, which is one of the most fundamental quantities of the probability distribution. Doesn't work anymore. Oh, okay, yes. So again, we tried it for different cases, and uh, please ignore this blue line. And uh, uh, both for the shifting and also the skinny, you see that when the dimension is low, we don't get too much improvement. The reason is because when the dimension is low, I mean, the number of samples we have is about, uh, a, in fact, is actually able to capture this empirical distribution is actually fairly close to the ground truth. So therefore, uh, we don't get a huge improvement. But as the dimension goes higher, and there's more noise in the in, in, in the in, in the p p compared to p star, so therefore we get a better improvement. So here you see that it actually does a pretty good job. It reduced the 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 the, the, the mean square error by almost ninety percent. And here I'm varying the different alpha alpha corresponding to what what co corresponding to varying different p star. So you see that over a wide range of p stars, the ground truth we get reasonable improvement. Uh, the alpha small is actually corresponding to very sparse distribution. Again, the improvement here is not very significant because number of sample is already very good for the for, for the naive estimate. And finally, we have this uh, uh, this n over d n over d corresponding to how many samples you have compared to the dimension of, of the probability distribution. You see that the improvement is about twenty percent to about uh, well, in this case all the way to about forty uh, percent sorry sixty percent. Finally, this is a kind of like an exciting example is that we can try to use this to estimate the try to improve the estimate for the Wasserstein distance between two probability distributions. So, uh, so f given two probability distribution p and q, this quantity I want to estimate is the square of the two Wasserstein distance. And in fact, you can also show that this is the convex uh, functional jointly in p and q. Why? Because this can be written as a constraint minimization problem. So uh, you can. Because the Wasserstein distance can be defined to be minimization of a coupling gamma, where gamma coupling project to the first direction is give you p, coupling project to the second direction is going to give you q, and you are minimizing over this uh, uh, quadratic. This, in fact, is a linear function in gamma with this quadratic loss between z and uh, two, 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 two domains. So therefore, it's a linear function. It fits nicely into this uh, constraint optimization problem. I, I give two slides ago, and in fact, you can you can do the computation here. And again, you see that we get some improvement. Typically, is about 20 to 30 percent. It's not spectacular, but but with a very general framework, if you can improve by 20, 30 percent, it's, it's it's worth a try. Okay. So in the remaining 10 or 15 minutes, I'm gonna talk about the second case, where uh, is a so-called matrix case. So in the matrix case, my function f itself is a map from a d-dimensional matrix to d-dimensional matrix. And the most specific, I'm going to convert this inverse map, which take my matrix and I result, uh, return to you the inverse of this function. Now here I consider the scenario which is a little bit similar to the original problem. Is I assume that I only have one single mean zero copy of my matrix A. And A star, the ground truth matrix, is unknown. And I'm trying to estimate F A star is equal to A star inverse. Now the question you first ask is that, is there any, I call this convexity bias. Is there any convexity here in this problem? Is A inverse convex in any way? The answer is yes. In a special case where A, for example, is symmetric positive definite matrices, and this operator is certainly convex in a certain sense. So here's the theorem, which is which is well known in the matrix analysis literature, but it's usually it's not taught in 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 for example linear algebra class. But but I think it deserves to be uh, known to be a, a more to the uh, students in the entry level linear algebra class. Here's the theorem: If you give me an A star, which is a symmetric positive definite matrix. And A to be the noise perturbation, A plus Z is the noisy version of A star, 
and it's almost it's also SPD almost surely, okay? Because if it has zero eigenvalue, I cannot talk about inverse. So therefore, the left hand side doesn't make sense. But let, let's assume it's also SPD, and assume that the expectation of a is equal to a star. So it's mean zero perturbation. The noise is mean zero. Then it is true that expectation of a inverse is always greater than or equal to a star inverse, and this greater it does mean it means that in the it means that the difference is in the positive definite cone. So for example, what I mean that B is this greater or equal to C if and only if B minus C is an SPD matrix, symmetric positive definite matrix. Okay? So for those of you who are working uh, optimization, and this should be familiar. So how do you prove this? I mean, I, I'm, this is so, such a nice result and very simple, but I mean, so the proof is also two lines. Maybe I'll, I'll quickly go through this. The two is just Taylor expansion. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the Taylor expansion this way. This is my matrix A star, which is in the comb of SPD matrix. This is my matrix A after you perturb with noise. And this is my SPD cone, right? Inside is SPD cone. So I'm going to link them together. And I do the Taylor expansion, use this as a base point and towards that direction. OK? So because I link these two matrices together along this line, so therefore this just become a Wendy problem, right? So it's called this direction T. And the Taylor expansion, which tells me that there will be a middle matrix AM here, AM stands for middle, such that this is true. A inverse, right, A star is my base point. This is equal to the first order Taylor expansion. Uh, this is the second order Taylor expansion. This is my base function value in my base point. This is my linear term, because this is what happens when you take the derivative of A inverse. This is what pops up. And this is the second order derivative. It's also not difficult to, to derive. Now, if you take the expectation of the inverse, the first term is still itself because it does not depend on the noise. The second term depends on the expectation of the a minus a star is zero because I assume the mean zero noise. And the last term is the expectation of this quantity. But if you take a look at this quantity here, this is look awful like a symmetric, right? Because this AM matrix in the SPD cone, it's also a symmetric matrix. So therefore, this is nothing but this matrix. So, so, so you have five matrices. The first two and the last two, if you take the transpose, they're exactly the same. And the middle one is also SPD, because it's in the SPD cone. So therefore, the last matrix is an SPD matrix. And if you take the average, that's also SPD. So that proves the theorem. So this quantity minus this is equal to expectation of this matrix is SPD. Now, so this is the theorem we can prove for the uh, SPD matrix. So instead of here, we are using this multiplicative correction. So instead of correcting a to try to use naive estimate a inverse, we use s times a inverse. And uh, you can also plug into this mean square array and try to take the derivative. You see that this is my oracle estimator. Again, I say that's oracle because it depends on a star inverse. Okay. So what Philip Etter, my 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 previous student who graduated this year, showed that in fact the factor s from here is always between 0 and 1. Okay? This is kind of like a stability. I mean, in fact, if you know the oracle estimator, it doesn't, you don't really care about it. It's between 0 and 1. But on the other hand, if you know that it is between 0 and 1, it helps you when you construct bootstrap estimators. Because you never amplify a quantity, meaning that you do not amplify noise. So that's a good thing, right? So in fact, what we can show is that there, this s you, you, you constructed will always bring down the mean square, right? And it, the important thing is that it, it, it's always between 0 and 1. So as I said, it's an oracle estimate. So what do we do? And we can use the bootstrap process again. And in here, I want to maybe I want to skip a little bit more details. Uh, well, uh, is that okay? So instead of trying to evaluate the here, uh, here I don't I assume I only have one single copy. So therefore, I have to make an extra assumption. Assume that I have the machine which allows me to implement noisy copies. So what I'm doing here is that in fact replace this with a bootstrap version. I replace A star with my A, my, 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 my current estimator, and replace A inverse, this random copy, with a bootstrapped copy, which I denote by A tilde T. Now, if you're using multiple bootstrap samples, you can approximate this quantity here, this right-hand side here, using the average copy you get from different bootstrap samples. Now, from the computational point of view, this is also hard, because you, now you need to invert quite many matrices, because if you run bootstrap a thousand times, there's a thousand matrix you need to invert, so that's not pleasant. So instead, we come up with this formula which is using perturbation analysis. So in fact, when the noise is small, we can use this perturbation analysis of the, to, perturb, to do a Taylor expansion of the A inverse and see that to get a second order approximation. The important thing about this second order approximation is that 
we can guarantee, this is a theorem, that we can guarantee that this is bounded between 0 and 1. So meaning that even though this is a bootstrap estimator, it does not amplify the noise. So for I quickly go through the two other cases. When for non-SPD matrix, we can say much less because this theorem, that beautiful theorem here, does not hold for non-SPD matrix. But on the other hand, we can rescue a little bit. We, for that, we need three conditions. The first is also the, the noise has to be mean zero. So expectation of my perturbation has to be drawn to the ground truth. The second is that the noisy distribution itself has to have this symmetric. So therefore, A minus A star not only has to mean zero, it also has to have to be symmetric. Finally, um, in the previous case, I, I did not say too much about this norm we're considering here. It could be any norm, in fact, a matrix norm. But in this non-SPD case, it has to be a very specific norm, which actually, which is related to the ground truth, which is we call the uh, residual inner product norm. Okay. So given these three conditions, we can prove a similar theorem, which, which is similar to the theorems that I proved to you later, but, uh, earlier, but it's a little bit more complicated. This replaced the previous theorem as, as, as a proxy for the convexity condition. And based on that, we can also uh, do the, the, find this, uh, this optimal scaling factor and show that it's actually between 0 and 1. Okay. Now, for the non-SPD case, which violated these three conditions, we can say much less. But here, I just want to say one example, which actually, which actually is useful. This is related to something called the Markov decision process. So uh, for those of you who are Markov decision process, you can think about is, is, is really you're moving on a Markov chain, and every step, you're going to collect some reward. And you want to see that what is the discounted reward you're going to get um, if you start from a certain point. Okay? So, uh, so maybe it just it's worth to spend one minute or two minutes to talk about it. So you have a Markov chain, uh, which the transition matrix is called P. And, uh, and then starting from every point, you can, you can collect a reward if you go one step. Now, the quantity that you care about is something called a value function which is equal to the intermediate reward that you collect plus a discount factor gamma times the p times the value function at the next step. Okay? So this is, appears a lot, for example, in reinforced learning, in Markov decision process. And now, in reinforced learning, you have to control this p, but let's consider a simple case where the transition matrix is, 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 is fixed. Now, the problem is trying to solve for v. And if you rearrange a little bit, you see that V is actually equals to identity minus gamma times P inverse times R. So the scenario we, we consider here is that suppose we don't know the P matrix exactly, right? I mean, if you know the Markov chain, you know exactly what the P matrix is. But suppose you're an observer. You look at how the game is played, how people transition from one place to another place. You can only observe noisy samples of these transitions, right? You only get an estimate of the transition matrix P. You don't get exactly the transition matrix P. Now, because you need to do start inverse, it's a nonlinear process. So therefore, this convexity bias business still comes in as well. Okay? But in this case, we're only going to prove much less. So here, the notation that P star is the under underlying uh, transition matrix. But on the other hand, I only get to observe noisy copy of the underlying transition matrix. And nevertheless, I still want to compute this value function. Now, if you take the P in the noisy copy and plug in, this is not the best you can do. But instead, you can try to use a scaled version. So this is the theorem which I proved with Tang Xun, uh, sh 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 my, my, my student, and also Yu Hua Zhu, who just recently moved to UCSD, is that, well, if you allow your sample, the, each row of the transition matrix with, with M samples, then there exists a multiplicative factor S. I cannot prove that it's less than 1, but it's only less than 1 plus small o over M, such that my, my improved estimator is that with a correction is, is better than the naive estimator. So this is much weaker than what we can prove, but, but, but that, that's, that's the best thing we can do. So this is the summary. So I, I talk about uh, this concept of convexity bias. I think it's, I, I mean, if you want to just remember two slides in this talk, or just two pictures I show you at the beginning, is, is this essentially illustrates the whole idea. So I claim that this is a fairly general framework and not necessarily optimal for a specific problem, but, but hopefully it's, it's quite general and applied to quite a lot of examples. And, uh, and, 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 uh, and, 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 and in this case, we derived not only just the Oracle estimator, we also derived the bootstrap estimator and proved a few theorems showing you that the bootstrap estimator can actually improve the uh, mean square error. And then we consider the matrix case. And the case that we can say a lot is about the SPD case. We have a rigorous theory. 
But for the non-SPD, the theory is weaker, but nevertheless, uh, it's also still quite useful in some of the scenarios like uh, MDPs. With that, I'd like to thank you for attention. And uh, these are the papers which relate to this talk. And finally, again, thank NSF for the funding. Okay. Oh, thanks. Uh, I'd like to ask, is, is anything known about a, um, say, a non-convex uh, or non-PK function where you have some control over the derivatives or the variations? Yep. And in general, the bootstrap estimator in that case worse or, or better than a non-PK function? Yeah, you, you see that, I mean, maybe I'll go back to the theorem. You see that theorem is actually only, uh, is the theorem is, is, is a simple version of the theorem statement. But if you take a look at the theorem, uh, the theorem is, is right here. The theorem is only actually dependent on quantity, which is at the ground truth. So if your noise, for example, has decays really rapidly, you don't really need to care too much about the shape of the function far away. So what you really need to care about is that in the effective neighborhood, by effective neighborhood, I mean that where the noisy copy can go to, in that region, the function is sufficiently convex, and then you're in good shape. Um, it could go worse. It could, it could go worse. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It's. I mean, for the shift version, I'm. I'm not sure, but maybe I think it will also go worse. But for the scale version, it will definitely go worse. That's very helpful. Yeah. Really yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, the constants in this equality, yes. So uh, in, in the proof, we, I think we derive some bound for n0, but it's, it's not optimal. It's far away from the, what we, the best number we're observing. In, in practice, as, uh, so yes, but we can, we can do more work, I mean, do more careful analysis to make n0 to be small, but, but um, we didn't do that in the, in the paper, but it's doable. And the second thing is that uh, I don't, even though we don't, the, 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 the constant derived in the proof is not optimal, but in most of the example, for example, you see that this, this n is actually quite small. n is fixed to be 10, but I, dimension I can go all the way to 1,000 dimensions. So therefore, I, I don't really need too many samples for this to work. But obviously, this depends on the problem. This problem is particularly nice, but for other problem, it might not be so good. Uh, this, this, this is a relative improvement. For example, if, by, by this number, I mean that is this is a relative mean square error improvements. So the original naive estimator is, is the baseline, so it's 100%. But here you see that this is roughly like 1.7, so it's improved by 30%. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, so I mean, that's, this, this theorem is uglier because I mean, uh, I have a lot of other terms, but in the clean version, it's really just depend on these two quantities. If you can control these two quantities, uh, you will get a better estimate. Yes. Oh, sigma. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sigma three is very nice. Thank you. So you see that I want this to be greater than zero. So therefore, th thanks. It's an important point. I'm, I forgot to say that. I forgot about this comment. So this quantity is always positive, right? So what you want, for this statement to be true, you want the sigma 3 not to be too negative. Right? So in fact, what essentially what says you want sigma 3 positive, it helps you. The sigma 3 negative, it's going to hurt you, but you don't want it to be too big. And if you take a look at this, as I said, the sigma 3 is essentially depends on the third order derivative. So it's a derivative of the Hessian. So what you want is that you want the Hessian to change smoothly away from your x star. If the Hessian changes suddenly too fast, then it's also going to hurt you. Because we're going to use bootstraps. The bootstrap means that I'm going to center at a slightly different point and sample its neighborhood. So therefore, if I move away too much, if the hashing at the other, the new point is very hugely different from the hashing at my base point, then it's bad. Convexity here doesn't mean convexity there, right? So that's why I need the third order derivative to be fairly small. It can improve, it can go the good direction. If it, I mean, if it go positive, then I'm happy. It's actually making it more convex, great. But, but if, if it becomes less convex, that's going to hurt me.
Okay. Thank you.